It's a story Hollywood's been telling for the best part of 70 years. A planet destroying space rock on a collision course with Earth, the survival of humanity placed in the hands of a few brave individuals. In its newest iteration, Don't Look Up, that task falls to two scientists who must convince an incredulous public that very soon, they're... But what would happen if this scenario unfolded in real life? How can we detect threats from outer space? And what defences currently exist to save the human race? There are a number of hazards that our species faces and probably the only one that could produce a mass extinction in a fairly short time is the threat from asteroids and comets. On February 15th, 2013, dash cams in the Russian city of Chelyabinsk captured something incredible and terrifying. A meteor the size of a six-story building broke up and exploded while hurtling through the sky about 28 miles above the city. The blast didn't kill anyone, but it did injure more than a thousand people and smashed windows in more than 3,000 apartment blocks. But maybe most disturbing about the blast was the fact that no one saw it coming, not even those that were looking. It's only a tiny bit, but uh, that's part of the Chelyabinsk meteorite. Former British Army Major Jay Tate runs the Space Guard Centre, a hilltop observatory in Wales dedicated to tracking asteroids and comets. He's part of a global effort between professional scientists and grassroots astronomers to identify and track asteroids and comets that could pose a threat to planet Earth. We were expecting the very close pass of a fairly large asteroid at about seven o'clock in the evening. And at about half past six in the morning, I got a telephone call from an unnamed newspaper saying, tell us about this asteroid. So I said, well, fine, uh, but why now? It's not happening until seven o'clock tonight. And they said, no, 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 the one that's just exploded over Russia. Despite exploding with the force of more than 30 Hiroshima bombs, the object over Chelyabinsk was, on a cosmic scale, pretty insignificant. It's only about 17 metres across. That's way below the threshold for the, um, the main search programs. Whenever conditions allow, Jay fires up Space Guard's telescope and sets to work tracking the asteroids identified by various survey stations, usually in the United States. There's one that crosses. Every day, he receives a list of objects from the Minor Planet Center, the global library of known asteroids and comets, which keeps track of what's whizzing about in the sky above our heads. This is today's list. Um, it's uh, relatively short today. Normally, that would be a couple of pages long. Jay then uses this data to locate the objects in the night sky. The aim of the game being to take uh, sets of photographs. We normally take three of each object and then we look to see if we can see something that moved between the three shots. And based on that, we can then determine its orbit round the sun and find out whether it's going to be a problem or not. As Jay and the other observatories dotted around the planet each contribute their separate data points, a map of the orbits of these cosmic bullets is slowly built. We've got an asteroid here. This one's actually called Apophis and it crosses the Earth's orbit twice for each of one of its orbits, once there and once here. Um, this is the one that could possibly come pretty close in 2068. Following the Chelyabinsk explosion, a congressional hearing was held in the USA to discuss the threats posed by asteroid impacts. We know that there are about a million of them out there. We know this by counting craters and by knowing what small fraction of the sky we've actually been able to survey thus far from the ground. NASA had already been tracking near-Earth objects since the 1970s, but in 1994 they received a mandate from the US Congress to find at least 90% of NEOs larger than one kilometre in size. By 2010, they pulled it off. Since then, the search for smaller sized objects has continued. Of the more than 24,500 near Earth objects discovered so far, none are currently believed to pose a threat. 
And luckily, we needn't worry about every little bit of space rock floating around out there. Earth comes with a pre-installed space defense system in the 60 or so miles of gases above our heads. Against the smaller stuff, it does a pretty good job. Every day, more than 100 tons of dust enters our atmosphere from space and gets burnt up before touching the surface. Slightly larger rocks too get smoked well before they hit the ground. You may have seen this happening if you've ever spotted a shooting star. The atmosphere is even capable of burning up car-sized space rocks, an event called a fireball, which according to NASA happens on average once a year. But as space rocks get bigger, the atmosphere struggles to take them out. NASA estimates that every 2,000 years a football field sized asteroid hits Earth. And every few million years, something comes along that threatens civilization. Most famous of these mega impact events happened 66 million years ago, when a six mile wide asteroid struck the Yucatan Peninsula in what is now Mexico. The cataclysmic explosion that followed is believed to have sent dust and debris rocketing into the atmosphere, blocking out the sun for a period of weeks. This is thought to have drastically altered Earth's climate, leading to the extinction of three quarters of all life on the planet, including the dinosaurs. Impacts on this scale are thankfully really, really rare, but smaller objects can still pose a threat. To take out a reasonable sized country or a small continent, you probably need something about 150, maybe 200 meters across. For global effects, then you'd be looking at something kilometer, maybe two kilometers across. We guess that mass extinctions begin to creep in between the sort of five to 10 kilometer size. The best estimate is that we found between 95 and 96% of all of the large ones that have orbits that cross the Earth. The smaller ones that could just take out a large country or down to a sort of city size, uh, we're probably still in the single figures of percentage, discovery-wise. In the early 20th century, Earth got a taste of the kind of damage one of these relatively small objects could do. The Tunguska event back in 1908, probably an object somewhere between 50 and 60 metres across. Never hit the ground, it was an airburst, but it took out an area about the same size as London inside the M25. The blast flattened about 80 million trees, its heat was felt 35 miles away, and estimates put the strength of the explosion at 180 times that of the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. It's like Chelyabinsk on steroids, where uh, the uh, main damage is from the blast wave in the atmosphere, the shock wave in the atmosphere, um, because it's actually very hard for an object to reach all the way to the ground. The atmosphere is very protective. Um, but the pressure wave that the, a large object punches through the atmosphere, that pressure wave does hit the ground. That's Richard Benzel. Professor of Planetary Science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's an expert on asteroid impact risk and the creator of the Torino Scale, a 0 to 10 measurement which astronomers can use to quickly gauge the risk any space object poses to Earth. At zero, an asteroid is completely harmless. And even at uh, one, two, three, or four in the scale, it simply means that we've discovered an object and we're still determining its orbit. And it's only when you get to the eight, nine, 10 at the upper end of the scale, then you are sure that you have an, a seriously hazardous object that is on a collision course with Earth. The risk of an event on this scale is very, very low and made even lower by the global effort by NASA and other agencies to find these massive objects. We've found 90% of all the largest asteroids, and then we're slowly trying to work our way down to smaller and smaller sizes. But this relies on the objects being close enough to be observed by Earth's telescopes, and not all of them are. The worst case scenario that, well, the nightmare, is that we find a large, long period comet. That's one with a period of more than 200 years, i.e. we've probably not you know, seen it before, with a course that will cross the Earth. In a case like that, we could probably expect at maximum two, maybe three years of notice. Not enough to do anything about it. So it would be a case of sit back and wait. Luckily, spotting them is just part of the defence plan. 
when we find one that's coming, we've really got three options. Um, the first is to sit back and do nothing and just let it all happen. Um, the second is try and blow it to bits. Um, not a good plan because you then are turning a cannonball into a cluster bomb. The third option is to give it a little nudge to change its orbit, its course, just enough that it misses the Earth. This plan is already in motion. It's called the DART mission, or the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, and it's basically a plan to crash an unmanned spacecraft into an asteroid. The one NASA has picked is called Didymos B, a small moonlet orbiting the larger Didymos A. Scientists hope to crash the spacecraft into the moonlet at 6 km per second, thereby changing its orbit in a way which should be observable on Earth. This will give scientists an idea of whether it would be possible to carry out a similar mission on an Earth-threatening asteroid in the future. The plan being that by altering an asteroid's trajectory very slightly, it should be enough to nudge it off its course with Earth. But for asteroids' icy cousins, comets, it's a little trickier. Because they're basically big fluffy snowballs, um, the normal methods probably wouldn't work. But if you can persuade part of that comet to vaporise very quickly, the vapour jetting outwards would act like a little rocket to push it off course. We've not tried it. Um, hopefully we will. Currently, the risks from all observable objects in our solar system are very low. But for Jay, that's no reason to let his guard or his telescope down. Do you insure your house? Um, the answer would almost certainly be yes. The next question is why? Do you expect it to burn down? No. Well, why do you insure it then? 